the southern New England tribes, we're talking dozens and dozens of tribes, were primarily riverine people. This is a pretty big fish right here. And I don't know what we're looking at here. I think it's a brown. He hit the... Uh, No, he's not that big. He felt, he looked big. He, he did the flop thing that he's doing right now. He's not small. Like, he's stunned. He was stunned. He was like, that was the best tasting morsel I've ever seen. And then, he's hooked. He can't believe it. Nice brown. He's like 15. Show them to you in a second. You can see he's a nice sized guy. Hooked in the bottom jaw. Hmm, get him up. Get a get a picture. <clears throat> nice fat guy. I can't get my hands around him. There he is. Back in the water. They lived along the river valleys. They would pursue game in the winter, starting in October, in hunting parties, with their primary villages being reduced in population by up to 80%. Here's another one. And he was like hunting that thing like a cat. I saw him up looking at it. And then he was off to the side. That was cool. He, he was like a shark on that. Another brown. Another decent sized brown. Like a cat. He stalked it. That was cool. No, it's a rainbow. So, there you go. Back in the water. Still a really cool hit. Small groups of Amerindians would pursue game, 15, 20, 30, building wigwams up in the Berkshires, up in the Worcester Highlands, up in the Taconics, to survive the winter understanding that the game, the deer, the moose, the bear, aren't stupid. So if they stayed in their villages within a very, very short period of time, they would have overhunted the area leading to tribal starvation. So they used this technique. They broke themselves up into these hunting parties. Say 20, 25, 30, 40% of the people stay in the villages. A lot of elderly young children <clears throat> with some good hunters who would go out and pursue game. They, they stored very little food. I was too lazy to put it on. Well, that's a better float right there. Some line out, let it, let it drift. Let it drift. There we go. All I had to do was dry it off. Another brown. This ain't a rainbow. This is Mr. Brown Trout. Okay. Uh, or is it Mr. Rainbow? I mean, that rainbow looked like a brown earlier. They're like giving up. They're coming in. That's another rainbow. Look at me. That's a bigger rainbow. Wow, that's a good rainbow. Holy cow. That rainbow... This is like a 17-inch rainbow, fat as a pig. But the river systems of southern New England were absolutely filled with various fish. And the, the fish that they liked particularly were the anadromous fish, the herring, 
alewives, shad, salmon that would come up the river in the spring. In the summer, because it's got a very uh, sloping, very steep watershed, right? While prone to flooding in the springtime, becomes very shallow in the summer, which allows people to build trickle dams. And the native people put up these trickle dams to take advantage of the big fish migrations. The shad, the blueback herring, alewives, lampreys. And it's designed to channel migrating fish through an area that allows the native people to trap, net, club, spear, or catch in any way they can, hands included these fish as they're proceeding up or down the river during the spawning season, right? During their great migration. And this, they would fish for anything, and they weren't catch and release people. It was going in their bellies. They didn't have too many methods of preserving food. I mean, there are some tales of the Amerindians smoking fish, but that may have been taught to them by contact with the Europeans who were drying cod, smoking and salting cod, down East Maine, northern New England coast. Nymphin, instead of doing the French nymphin, and that guy hit, he was waiting right there for it. So I was patient, right? I, I said to myself, stop trying to get out in the middle of the stream and, and just fish, fish the fish that are right here. Don't be stupid. There's one of them pterodactyls right there. Look at that thing. He sees me with a fish on He's He's coming over to investigate. Look at him. Ah, crazy pterodactyls. I know he wants my fish. The blue heron. That's really not a pterodactyl, everybody. People from Chicopee are going to think that I, I've got pterodactyls up here on the uh, who's a tonic. I want to scare my Chicopee friends. So I got him coming. And this guy, he don't seem to be that big. He's not small, though. Look at him. He's not small. He didn't like me bringing him up out of the water like that. Oh yeah, look at him. He's a fat guy. Another nice, mar nicely marked brown. Oh, look at him. Nice. And where did he get it? Which one did he hit? Uh, he hit the bottom fly. And he got it right in the nose. Look at this guy. Nice, big, fat. Little guy, right? See him? Got a belly on him. And he's got them beautiful, beautiful spots. Back he goes. Hero nymph action here. I don't know who's a tonic. I don't know what we're looking at. Could be a bass. Could be a decent brown, too. He hit on the inside in this thick current. You've got a whirlpool like an eddy here. He's really digging. Oh, yeah, he's digging. I'm not going to stand in his way. I'm going to let him fight out there. Oh, yeah. It's Mr. Brown Trout. And he, he was sitting here in this eddy. He was waiting for a meal. And he got one in the form of a nymph. Oh, good fish. Good fish. I got to keep him. I just retied, so let's hope everything's good with that retie. This guy's, this guy's a decent size brown here. I don't want to jump into the pool and spook anything in there because he was right out in front of me by 10 feet. He just buried this. He hit hard and he's he's digging. You can see him. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, he's digging. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I'm going to go down here and I'll be able to go in the pool where there's not going to be I don't want to let him get down there. This water's high right now. So let's hope, let's hope I can get him in right over here. There he is. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. Yep, flashing, throbbing, doing what brown trout do. Barbless hook. Got to keep the pressure on the guy. There he is. So he's a nice little brown. I would say 16. Maybe even a little bigger. Oh, well, it's not a barbless hook. I thought it was barbless. Well, let me get him in the water. I got the, my floating net. Oh, yeah, it was barbless. It fell right out. So you can see this guy. 
right here. Nice size fish. Beautiful markings. And let's get another one. Coast. So the point is, when you look at the river valley behind me, the Lusitonic River, this was a magnet for the Amerindians who came here. They say to match the hatch. The second I got a fly on that matched the hatch, this brown trout decided to come pay me a visit. So there's a lot to be said. I mean, I was using locator flies, I was using a lot of different things. And the second I put this little brown number 18 on he, he struck and it was just a little sip up on the top nice fish nice brown trout in the Housatonic here been talking about it now I had <laughs> Two fish dead on on the locator fly. They weren't hitting the dropper today. This guy right here ain't a bad fish. He, he's a solid fighting brown trout. I'm going to get him in so I can get another one. There's dozens of them out there. In the net she goes. Big fat brown trout. A nice fat 17 inch rainbow trout. I mean rainbow trout, brown trout. Lichen crusted, moss covered obelisk. Erected in 1877, marking the site of the burial ground of the Stockbridge Indians. Known to their own people and to themselves as the Busatana. A branch of, yes. Mahikins, or as Hank Fenimore Cooper called them, the Mohicans.